I got interested in UFOs really by accident because my boss asked me what he ought to say to the Air Force to predict how we should go to orbit back in 10 years hence. This was 1968. And so just for a lark, I said, well, hey, why don't you tell them how the alleged UFOs do it? And he said, that's a great idea. Why don't you work on that? So I read the first book, which was a book by Menzel, and concluded, hey, this guy's ignoring the evidence. So I read more books, and pretty soon I'd read 50 books. And and I actually went to my management and said, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you, but the fact of the matter is that the UFOs are manned by aliens from somewhere else, and the only thing that's a question is whether we discover how they work before Lockheed. And so why don't we start a little project to work on that problem? And so we wound up spending a half million dollars of company money at the same time the Condon Committee was doing their thing. And then so for the next 25 years, I had to work on other interesting things Black Project here and there, Ballistic Missile Defense Space Station. When I retired in 1993, however, my colleague Stan Friedman said, I know you don't have anything to do, so I've got a question document here. Maybe you'd like to take a look at its authenticity. And so I wound up looking at the Special Operations Manual, which actually, this is a replica of the Special Operations Manual that uh, tells how the, our personnel should go and recover craft and where to send the bodies and the parts. So and then, later on, uh, we got encouraged to go visit a fellow by the name of Tim Cooper, who had a, a trove of documents that were coming in the mail. So uh, Ryan became involved at that time after my retirement, but he was involved long before that. My involvement it comes from my father's uh, interest in, in, in UFOs, and, and I met Stan Friedman when I was 15, you know, in 1970. and. Uh, had always sort of a background interest as an analyst, never seen anything, no, uh, no lights in the sky, no abduction experiences, nothing weird. It's always been as an analytical uh, abstraction, intellectual pursuit of the phenomenon. And that's where I, it's my comfort zone. So that's where I, I, I stay with documents. And so I was exposed to it. And then when the documents started coming in, in 1993, uh, with the or in '94 with uh, Don Berliner's Special Operations Manual, that was uh, sort of a watershed event. That was a big thing. There was a lot of data and information, and then um, a lot more data came from Tim Cooper uh, in the late '90s. Uh, and it's interesting that you know people uh, say, "Well, who is this guy, Tim Cooper?" and and the reality is that Tim is a very interesting guy. He, he's sort of a, a former Marine, and his father is even more interesting, which is the fascinating part is that his father got accommodation from Curtis LeMay uh, for his outstanding work at the uh, United States uh, Air Force UFO program. You know, it's right there in black and white on his uh, gold embossed uh, accommodation from Curtis LeMay, you know, with signatures and everything. So there, and he, he worked at Int Air Force Base uh, and did work for the National Photographic Interpretation Center, what's called NPIC, uh, and has a lot of UFO pictures, but none of them have ever been declassified or released to this day. Uh, so uh, Tim Cooper's father was a very interesting character, and no doubt uh, from the time Tim was a little boy, he, his father and his father's friends were in and around the house and got exposed to UFO topic and, and so forth. And Tim was ahead of the curve and began filing uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, oh, in the, uh, in the 80s, late 80s and 90s, and I think it's his interest in being one of the first to ask for documents uh, related to, uh, you know, White Sands and Atomic Energy Intelligence and uh, v various files that were obscure and the declassifiers uh, let it go or, or were sympathetic and, and uh, you know, violated secrecy and, and sent it out, uh, or they didn't know that they were violating secrecy. That's well, at a minimum, they missed at least one document that yeah. is right. J-12. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 true. So, it, the the combination of uh, of uh, investigation and uh, intrigue and being on the cutting edge of a a new field uh, had a lot of charm and appeal as a hobby. I have a real job, like most people, and. Um, 
so we just pursue our leads and keep trying to validate the authenticity of these leaked documents, which are uh, so stunning in content that uh, your first question is after you read them, well, oh my God, if they're real, this is an incredible uh, situation. Uh, and, and so you have to step back and say, are they real? How do we know they're real? And that's why we, we focused in on sort of an arcane and potentially uh, boring to most people details of, of uh, crime scene investigator meets UFO documents, yeah. uh, authenticity issues. So um, th that's what we've been doing uh, for the past, you know, we have about 10, four, 15 years. About 4,000 pages of documents that have been leaked, uh, of which about 800 are top secret, and many of them are classified otherwise. The techniques that you use for authenticating the documents range all the way from looking at the paper, if you have the original, the watermark, to the ink. You know, you can do chromatographs of the ink and find out when that ink was first introduced into society. You can't prove that <coughs> some government agency didn't save it for 30 years so they could create a false document, giving the impression, <laughs> you know, that it was 30 years old. but. Most likely that's not the case. We, and we can match the type fonts. And so we basically, we try to do the same things that you'd do if you had to provide testimony in a court of law. Are the documents authentic? Has our research shown that they're authentic? And the, the answer is it depends on which document you're talking about. You have so many, you have to teach, take each document and its mosaic of, uh, of attributes, uh, paper, ink, original, not original, uh, content, words, checkable, details, facts, um, all in, in a different perspective on each document. But I would say that we're, we're confident of the vast majority of them and we have a few pages, literally, uh, maybe 10 pages that we are stroking our chin about and, and are having to do more research to decide whether or not they're yeah. uh, doctored or not. We can't answer all the skeptics' questions and all the documents, but as Ryan says, it's down to about 10 pages. One of the things that comes up is the forensic linguistics aspect, which is really an area that's opening up for us. We have several documents where we feel that we can make a lot of progress by uh, doing that sort of thing, matching the phrases that were used by the particular people who are thought to have been the authors. Yeah. Then you also have etymology, in other words, the use of language. And I think that's particularly interesting in the Special Operations Manual because the words first aid were initial caps then in this, in this manual, but now they're a lower case when everybody talks about first right, aid. Right, or, or the word uh, screwdriver oh, it was two words instead of one word where it is commonly now. And, and that's a hallmark of authenticity. You would have used two words back then. Today you would use one word.